uh, so catch up with us. Um, our president, Philippa Newfield, is not going to be able to make it. Uh, she's got a good excuse. Uh, her grandson, I believe, is graduating from college today. So um, I yes, get to kind of... a granddaughter, but... It's granddaughter, the okay. I, uh, I uh, decided that was a reasonably good excuse. That, that's fair. <laughs> Wait just a minute here and see what else we can Jim, before we get started, and I'll forget if I don't ask you now, have you have, have we already uh, uh, been given uh, been made privy to the topic of your uh, molten lecture, or uh, uh, so, can you say something about that? Yeah, it's uh, I guess Philippa or the powers that be wanted me to kind of focus since the Ohio is now part of the official trail, is to kind of focus on the then and now aspects of it and to kind of boost tourism possibilities and things like that so uh so that's i'm so i'm not i said well that's fine if that's what you'd like so uh so i'm going to focus kind of on the 1803 down the ohio and then also jump kind of back and forth as to what's there now and things like that Sounds good. We're looking forward to it. That's what, about August 8th or so, uh, so I believe? Yeah, August 7 to 11, I think, is yeah. the meeting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the lecture's the last day, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's the banquet talk, I guess. Okay. Well, we're looking forward Maybe. to that. I don't know for sure. When Jim talks, people listen. <laughs> ah, yeah, right. <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, those of you who are uh, members of the Lewis and Clark uh, Trail Heritage Foundation Southwest region, of which I am vice president. Uh, like being vice president, it really doesn't uh, require much of me except the occasional introduction of great speakers like uh, Jay and and, uh, and today we have uh, Jim Holmberg. So uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, I, I typically don't do the muting, although I will if necessary. It would be great if people would just remember to stay muted uh, until the end, at which point we will have a Q&A session and you can certainly unmute then and uh, ask a question. Uh, you can also uh, put a question in the chat box at the bottom of the screen and uh, type it in and, uh, and we'll get to it that way at the end uh, as well. Um, I think probably everyone uh, uh, knows or knows of Jim Holmberg, but I'll just say a couple of quick things about him. Uh, and of course, I had to write them down to make sure that I wouldn't mistake anything. But uh, Jim has been curator of special collections at the Filson uh, Historical Society in Louisville for low these many years. And uh, mm -hmm. he is uh, a uh, eminent uh, Lewis and Clark scholar. Uh, writes and lectures on uh, Lewis and Clark with particular interest uh, in William Clark and I think the Clark family has been an enormous help to me uh, in my own research, uh, particularly with Clark, uh, Clark related uh, questions and also York. Uh, numerous publications, one of which I'll just see if I can show you and that is uh, a book that all Lewis, serious Lewis and Clark scholars make use of. Uh, with some regularity, and that's the uh, addition of the uh, of some of the letters uh, of uh, William Clark to Jonathan Clark in particular. Uh, Yale University Press, I think, 2002, a number of other uh, works as well. Uh, he has served on national, state, and local boards of several Lewis and Clark organizations, chair of the Kentucky Lewis and Clark Bicentennial uh, Commission, um, and uh, maybe some other things that'll tell us about. But today, uh, as you can see, uh, the, uh, he's going to be speaking about uh, expedition member Jar uh, Charles Floyd. And uh, the title of the, of the talk is The Life, Death, and Monument of Charles uh, Floyd, uh, a Young Man of Much Merit. Jim, take it away. All right. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys, uh, fellow Lewis and Clarkers, uh, as we say. Uh, and, and yeah, the topic is Charles Floyd, his life, what we know of it, his death, which we know a little bit thanks to journal entries, and then the monument, which uh, was built, uh, which we know quite a bit about because of government records and correspondence and things like that. 
And so being a local guy from born here in Louisville and, and grew up in the area, and of course, once he went out on the expedition, never came back, he became a, an interest of mine some years ago. And I still poke about and keep an eye out for him and, and others of those nine young men from Kentucky uh, that, uh, that we're always hoping to find more about. And I don't need to explain to any of any of you all, of course, that the Lewis and Clark expedition is one of the most famous exploring ventures in the history of the US, if not the world. And that when Lewis and Clark were putting together this group of explorers, the core of discovery, they had to have chosen well. Uh, if the foundation was weak, if it was flawed, what you build on is gonna collapse later. And when they, put those nine young men from Kentucky plus York, who of course was, was uh, ex officio. He was never a, a, a accepted member or an official member of the party. Uh, they, chose, they chose well, they trained the men well, uh, they led them well. And the expedition of course was a, was a huge success. And an important part of that successful mission yeah. was a, right at the Falls of the Ohio here at Louisville and Clarksville and a few other towns, cities right here in the area. Uh, okay. Clark moved across the river to Clarksville from Louisville from his farm Mulberry Hill outside Louisville in the spring of 1803 because he'd impoverished himself trying to help his brother George with his very tangled financial and legal affairs. The Falls area was a perfect place to do uh, recruiting for the expedition. Louisville was the last major town on the Ohio River. It was a major transportation route westward, of course, the river. It was from there that the frontiersmen and pioneers often departed on their Western adventures. And it was here that the, the rugged and, and talented men uh, who were needed as the hunters and, the, and the, the woodsmen, the scouts on the expedition lived. They were the, of course, who would become the nine young men from Kentucky. They had been born here in Kentucky or they moved here as, as children. They'd grown up on the frontier, learning all the skills necessary to survive on the frontier and in the wilderness. These were the, the as, as uh, Lewis put it in his letter to Clark, the good hunters, stout, healthy, unmarried men, accustomed to the woods and capable of bearing bodily fatigue in a pretty considerable degree. They would become the members of those famous nine young men from Kentucky, part of that all important nucleus, that, that important foundation that I mentioned that formed the core of discovery. William Clark already knew some of these young men uh, that would be valuable members of the expedition and he wasted no time in recruiting them. On July 24th, 1803, he wrote Lewis that he had temporarily engaged some men for the enterprise and that he believed were capable of the expedition's demands. Almost a month later on August 21st, Clark reported that he had promised to engage four young men on the expedition who were, as he put it, the best woodsmen and hunters of young men in this part of the country. While official acceptance perhaps had to wait until Lewis arrived in Louisville on October 14th, three were such sure things and so committed to the endeavor that they bear enlistment dates of August 1st, two and a half months before Lewis and Clark actually joined forces. They were the first permanent enlisted members of the Corps of Discovery. And I think as we all know, they were the brothers Joseph and Reuben Field and Charles Floyd. The Field brothers served through the entire expedition and received high praise from Lewis in his post-expedition report. Floyd had also made an impression and Lewis's assessment might've been even more flattering for this, as he put it, young man of much merit had he survived and gone on the entire expedition. But as we know, he fell sick and died near present Sioux City, Iowa on August 20th, 1804. The only fatality of a member of the Corps of Discovery. So who was this young explorer and soldier who had gained the confidence and trust of Lewis and Clark 
and demonstrated such potential. Little is known of Charles Floyd's life prior to the expedition. He was a member of one of Kentucky's prominent pioneer families. His uncle, John Floyd, penetrated Kentucky in the mid 1770s as a surveyor. He had uh, cast his lot with Kentucky and became one of its early leaders. He also has secured title to large tracts of land. And in 1779, he settled on one of these tracts in Jefferson County near the frontier village of Louisville. John Floyd did not come to Kentucky alone. As thousands of other pioneers did, the Floyds came to Kentucky as a family, an extended family. In the fall of 1779, the Floyds left Amherst County, Virginia and settled by way of the Cumberland Gap, or came by way of the Cumberland Gap and the Wilderness Road to Floyd Station on the Middle Fork of Beargrass Creek. What you see here is what's left of the spring house at Floyd Station. It used to be larger than that, but uh, through the years, it's kind of been whittled, I'll say vandaled away, decayed away. And that's the little bit of it that's left in present St. Matthews, just east of, of Louisville. Well, it's a Louisville Eastern suburb. With this group uh, of settlers was Floyd's brother, Robert Clark Floyd and his family. Robert has married Lillian Hampton sometime before 1773. They had two children when they moved to Kentucky and two more were born afterwards. The Floyds farmed and with settlers sought to wrest Kentucky from the Native Americans, uh, the Indians who were so are trying so hard to defend it against these uh, as they saw the invaders. Robert Floyd served in the militia under George Rogers Clark including duty as a scout, eventually and eventually rose to the rank of major. And if you look at this document here, this is from 1792. It's a Kentucky militia record regarding a, the board for a court martial. And you'll see there in that left column, uh, Captain Robert Floyd, Charles's father, uh, who is again active and, and a leader. A brutal 20 year war was waged along the frontier. Indian attacks were an ever-present threat, and Kentuckians launched their own campaigns of death and destruction against Indian towns north of the Ohio. It was into this frontier environment that Charles was born about 1782. Other additions also were being made to the extended Floyd family, but there were losses as well. In April of 1783, Charles's uncle, John Floyd, was killed by Indians south of Louisville. This was the frontier Kentucky in which Charles Floyd grew up. Self-reliance, vigilance, resourcefulness, duty, and other traits all combined with frontier skills to help assure one's survival. Even then, life could come to a quick end through violence or disease. Although Charles would have not have remembered his uncle John, he undoubtedly heard stories about his exploits and perhaps those of his own father and other pioneers. Uh, this is an interesting document. This is a, uh, a, a record of militia scouts on patrol around the Bear Grass, the Pond Creek, the general Louisville area. And you will see that uh, Robert Floyd is listed there as having served 86 days from the 8th of May uh, into August of 1792. Uh, and that where he lived, this is uh, this kind of information is absolute gold to researchers, uh, as you all know. Uh, he's listed as living on bare grass, his residence, and his age is 45, and that he's married. But what's really interesting about this document, and one reason I wanted to show it to you all, is that look down a couple of names, and you see John Field and Lewis Field who also are serving as scouts, or as they call them, spies, who were patrolling the area uh, to see if there was any sign of Indian raiding parties uh, to give warnings to settlements and stations and things like that. And that there at the Pond Creek settlement, the Pond settlement, as it was known, uh, these two fields, they're not, I don't believe they're brothers, they're probably cousins maybe uncles or something of uh, Joseph and Reuben 
their father, Abraham Field, uh, had moved from the fish pools, which is south of Louisville, over into the southwestern part of Jefferson County to the Pond Creek settlement, and they had a farm there. So the Floyds, the Fields, again, this is a, Aaron and I were mentioning just before everybody came on that, you know, this is a one degree, two degrees of separation back then where so many people, they knew each other and, and were either related by blood, served in the militia together, you know, knew each other in one way or another. And so the Floyds and the Fields definitely knew each other. The threat of Indian attack was present until 1794 when Charles was about 12 years old. In August of that year, the Confederation of Northwestern Tribes was defeated by Anthony Wayne's army at Fallen Timbers. Young Charles would have worked on his father's farm and performed a variety of other chores. He did receive some schooling enough to be literate as evidenced by his expedition journal. His handwriting was deliberate and his spelling poor but he could clearly read and write. Perhaps seeking a better opportunity, Robert Floyd moved across the Ohio to Clarksville Township by 1799. In 1803, Robert and his oldest son, Davis, operated a ferry at the foot of the falls from Clarksville to the Kentucky shore. Charles might have helped with the boat, gaining some experience for his future exploring endeavor. The abilities that enabled him to be a prized expedition recruit and sergeant were in evidence by 1802. By that year, some 20-year-old Charles was named the constable of Clarksville Township, a very responsible position for someone so young. In July 1802, he was awarded the contract to carry the mail between Louisville and Vincennes. This was a weekly 220-mile round trip through country that was still largely unsettled. Charles would have traveled the route on horseback, his supplies and mail bags slung to each side, or perhaps with a pack horse in tow. Always on the lookout for potential trouble, he would have made his own camp at night or stayed in an available house or tavern. Whether Charles' brother-in-law, Louisville Postmaster Thomas Wynn, arranged for this, this his relative to receive this lucrative contract isn't known. But given what is known about Floyd, one can assume he successfully carried the mail over this daunting route. In the spring of 1803, when William and George Rogers Clark had settled at Point of Rocks on the eastern edge of Clarksville, their farm was at the foot of the falls and had a commanding and beautiful view of them. Two miles upriver at the head of the falls, Louisville could be seen. The Clarks almost certainly used the Floyd's Ferry to go back and forth across the river. It is also possible that Charles delivered their mail from the Louisville Post Office to Clarksville. Perhaps one of those letters was Meriwether Lewis's invitation to William Clark to join him on the expedition to the Pacific and to recruit young men for the enterprise. Among his first recruits, as I've already said, was Charles Floyd. What Charles did over the summer and fall of 1803 while awaiting Lewis's arrival isn't known. He likely continued his work as post rider and constable and might have assisted Clark regarding expedition recruitment. How involved his affairs were isn't known, but he most likely spent some time putting his affairs in order in anticipation of the Corps' Western departure. He might have visited family and friends. His uncle, Charles Floyd, Uh, his uncle Charles Floyd and cousins lived along Mill Creek in southwestern Jefferson County. This was the neighborhood that the Field brothers hailed from, as I'd mentioned. They had grown up on the nearby Pond Creek, and the area was collectively known as that Pond Creek settlement. Floyd apparently was close to his cousins, as evidenced by their sadness upon receiving news of his death, and he may have known the Field brothers as well. In fact, it almost certainly before they were recruited, he did. And by 1807, Charles's father, Robert, had moved back across the river to the Pond Settlement. So again, you have that back and forth. Also, as summer became fall, a regular watch would have been kept on the Louisville waterfront for Lewis's boat. When it finally hove into sight on October 14th and landed in Louisville, 
Clark was undoubtedly was there to meet his partner in discovery. It is possible that Floyd was at his side. Over the next two weeks, six more recruits were enlisted. Affairs put in order, goodbye said, and final arrangements made. On October 26, the keel boat and red pirogue, as we believe it, uh, bearing the nucleus of the Corps of Discovery, pushed off from Clarksville down the Ohio and into history with the nine young men, York, Lewis's dog, uh, Seaman, uh, Lewis and Clark, of course, and a temporary party to help work the boats. They wouldn't return for three years. Charles Floyd, of course, never returned. Progress down the Ohio to its confluence with the Mississippi was steady but slow. The river was higher than the low water that had plunged, plagued Lewis in descending the river from Pittsburgh, but it was still low enough to impede an easy float downstream. Uh, down the river, the Ohio they went, then up the Mississippi, uh, and of course established their winter camp of 1803-04 at Wood River, uh, Camp Dubois or River Au Dubois, Dubois. Uh, this after the Spanish flat out said they weren't going to let him go up the Missouri until that country was, uh, the territory was officially turned over to the United States. Life for the explorers and waiting settled into a pattern that winter of 03 and 04. Lewis spent much of the winter in Cahokia and St. Louis, gathering information and conducting business. Clark spent most of the time at the Wood River camp preparing the men, the boats, and the party as a whole for a spring departure. Existing evidence indicates that Floyd was an important aide during this time. Clark had him carry the first dispatches from Camp Du Bois to Lewis and the post office in Cahokia. He performed courier duty throughout the winter and into the spring. Lewis expressed similar confidence in Floyd. On February 20th, 1804, Lewis issued detachment orders regarding command of the camp during the absence of both Clark and himself in St. Louis. Sergeant John Ordway was pl placed in overall command, but Floyd was also given an important responsibility. Lewis ordered that Floyd will take charge of our quarters and store, and he will be exempt from guard duty until our return. The commanding officer hopes that this proof of his confidence will be justified by the rigid performance of the orders given him on that subject. He addressed the orders to Floyd, so Charles apparently was in charge of seeing that they were read and posted. He was again assigned that duty on April 7th when both captains were in St. Louis. Sergeant Floyd will stay in our quarters, attend to them and the store and to the other duties required by, of him. He will also assist Sergeant Ordway as much as possible. But Floyd did not uh, did get to roam the woods and prairies hunting on occasion. Not long after arriving at Wood River, Clark sent Floyd and fellow Kentucky and John Shields out hunting, and they brought in seven fat turkeys. Adjusting to military life was not easy for some of the Kentuckians. Reuben Field and John Shields were both taken to task by Lewis in detachment orders dated March 3rd. Floyd apparently experienced no such problems. In those same orders, Lewis directed that the entire party was to follow Ordway's or orders directed by the captains, with the exception of Floyd, who had been specially directed to perform other duties. Lewis and Clark's confidence in Floyd and his fellow Kentuckian and first cousin, Nathaniel H. Pryor, was demonstrated on April 1st when they and John Ordway were officially appointed sergeants. Each was placed in command of a squad. Floyd commanded the second squad. Demonstrating that connection between them, Floyd's squad included Joseph and Reuben Field. And in this image, you see the, uh, the wonderful uh, Michael Haynes artwork from the Kentucky Frontiersmen transitioning to the Lewis designed uniform for the Kentucky recruits. Uh, that, of course, joined the Army, weren't already in the Army, but they enlisted for the duration of the expedition. By mid-May, the waiting was over. Upper Louisiana had passed to the United States. The winter ice and floods were gone, and final preparation 
was complete. On May 14, 1804, the Corps of Discovery started up the Missouri River. Two days later, they reached St. Charles and delayed there until Meriwether Lewis joined them after concluding his business in St. Louis on May 20th. And the next day they proceeded on under a gentle breeze. The journey of exploration into the American West itself had begun. Charles Floyd kept a journal of the day-to-day -day progress of the expedition. Uh, we of course know others that had kept journals. Uh, Jefferson told the captains, the captains told the sergeants and anybody else that wanted to. And here you can see the first page of Charles Floyd's journal uh, bought at River Du Bois, uh, March 13th, 1804. And then his first page of just like Clark's, uh, he states that they set off on May 14th, 1804, uh, gives the weather uh, and, and other basics of the information uh, of the daily goings on. Floyd's, of course, journal would end three months later. Others continued throughout the expedition. Some were a bit happenstance. Uh, they copied uh, freely from each other. You can imagine at the end of a long day uh, being tired. They uh, took a look at each other's and, uh, and did that. Uh, but they're very basic. Uh, and Floyd's, uh, his journal uh, is obviously the briefest, of the surviving accounts, but unlike some of the others, it has survived. Uh, we know Frazier's uh, has disappeared. Uh, gases, uh, the family says, was washed away. The original was washed away in an Ohio River flood. Uh, very possibly, Lewis kept more than is what is known, and it has disappeared. Clark's Field notebooks, only a couple of them survive. So things have been lost and there might've been others prior as a sergeant should have kept one. Uh, it's never been found. So there are missing ones and it's very fortunate as we'll see a little bit further down the road here in the talk, uh, how it came to light again. Floyd didn't complain, no mention of mosquitoes, no mention of his own activities for the most part, uh, but he does report that of others. He provides little detail regarding close calls, uh, a simple, straightforward account of the basic occurrences of the journey, a day-to-day -day struggle to move the boats, especially the barge up the wild, unpredictable, and potentially dangerous Missouri. Uh, it's written with great brevity. Uh, where they camp, distance traveled, coming and going of hunters and their success, travelers encountered coming downstream, and a description of the land, especially a description of the land appraising it and its appeal to the American settlers that they were confident would follow in, uh, in their footsteps. Uh, and in fact, perhaps in Floyd's mind, his, his own family that might follow in the wake of Lewis and Clark. Now, every once in a while, if you read the journals, I'm sure probably everybody has, one, one journal keeper will say something that nobody else did. And Floyd goes absolutely off on Moses Reed and his desertion. Uh, he gives more detail than any of the other journalists do uh, in, in giving the specifics about how he, he said he left his knife in the, in the camp uh, from the day before and he went back for it and didn't come back. Uh, and then of course, he, he, they sent a party out, they got him, brought him back and that, and that Floyd is just outraged that he would do this. He felt it was a real betrayal and said that there was no justification for him doing something like that. So uh, again, you get these, these wonderful little unique references that uh, not everybody always, always mentions. Charles Floyd's life on the Lewis and Clark uh, expedition, uh, was a daily grind. It was for all of them of exhausting work and responsibility balanced by the wonders of discovery and the beauty of the land. Uh, an occasional opportunity to roam on shore or hunt. In fact, wait a minute, let me go through. There we go. I almost skipped the, uh, the one where he gets into uh, Moses Reed. Uh, and then he continues over on to the next, uh, next page of his journal talking about what Reed, uh, Reed had done. 
that sometime during the day, perhaps around their fires at night, he and his fellow sergeants had been ordered to record, as, as they were told, all passing occurrences and such other observations on the country as shall appear to them worthy of notice. And again, after a hard day's work, you can imagine that was probably a pretty unwelcome chore. The surviving journals reflect the waxing and waning interest in this duty. Uh, and it is clear that liberal consultation, comparison, and flat out borrowing occurred between the journal keepers, including Lewis and Clark. But while the entries were often brief and for the most part contain only the basic events of their busy and exhausting day, most of them, including Floyd, carried out this charge faithfully. As the men worked their way up the Missouri that spring and summer, the bonding that had begun among the first recruits of the Falls of the Ohio continued with the larger group during the winter at Camp Du Bois and became even stronger. While some disciplinary problems occasionally occurred, they became rare and those who were not dedicated to their comrades and their mission were weeded out. Of course, Reed being a, a, being a perfect example of that. The Corps increasingly became a cohesive, experienced and dedicated unit determined to accomplish their mission for their country, their president, and for each other. They also became something of a family, even more so after the Charbonneaux joined them in 1805, caring and worrying about one another. The role Charles Floyd would have played in the entire expedition is unknown. One can expect that he would have continued as a sergeant, further maturing in that position, making an important contribution to the expedition's success and leaving a significant chronicle of his and the Corps' experience. But we will never know. In late July, there were hints that all was not well to Sergeant Charles Floyd. Sergeant Floyd, very unwell, a bad cold, recorded William Clark in his journal entry for Monday, July 30th, 1804. Floyd himself, being the good soldier he was, and apparently not wanting to complain, did not mention his illness until July 31st, the day after Clark first mentioned it. And one wonders maybe having read Clark's journal and seeing Clark had mentioned it, maybe he thought, well, I can go ahead and, and complain and say something now. But even then he only recorded that he was very sick and has been for some time, but have recovered my health again. Sergeant Ordway noted in his journal on that same date that Floyd had been sick several days, but now is getting some better. Whether this was the initial phase of the appendicitis and eventual ruptured appendix that is the most widely believed cause of Floyd's death isn't known. If it was indeed only a cold, as Clark describes it, it must have been a truly terrible one. The Corps continued upriver unaware that Floyd was not well and an infection apparently was working its poison on him. Three weeks later on August 19th, the journal keepers recorded that Floyd was again very ill. Some of the journal keepers recorded that Floyd, that, uh, some of the entries are almost identical, providing an example of the men copying from each other's journals. Clark recorded that Sergeant Floyd is taken violently bad with a bilious colic and is dangerously ill. We attempt in vain to relieve him. I am much concerned with his situation. We could get nothing to stay on his stomach a moment. Nature appears ex exiting fast in every man and every man is attentive to him, York principally, or maybe primarily he meant. Floyd's illness is reflected in when he stopped keeping his journal. His last entry is August 18th, and it's August 19th when everybody starts reporting that he's very ill in a, in a bad way. And yet on that last entry, whether he realized it or not, he didn't say he was sick yet. So perhaps his illness when it came back hit him like a truck and, uh, and laid him out, and that was the end of his journal. August 18th, 1804, his last journal entry. It is not surprising that everyone was concerned. Floyd apparently was liked by his fellow explorers, was highly thought of by the captains, and he and York undoubtedly knew each other even before the expedition. 
Also, this was apparently the first time on the expedition that the men actually feared for the life of one of their party. Bilious colic was a common term used during that time to describe digestive maladies of various types, stomach, intestinal, what have you. A common treatment for it and other illnesses was purging and bleeding. Whether this was done in an attempt to give Floyd relief is uncertain. If they did, it may have only hastened his death. If Floyd was indeed suffering from an infected or ruptured appendix, laxatives only would have ex exacerbated his condition. Clark does not record what vain attempts were made to help their comrade, but nothing Lewis and Clark or the other men did helped. During the night, Floyd worsened to the point that Clark feared for his life. He stayed up most of the night with him, but could do nothing for the fast sinking sergeant. I am dull and heavy, Clark wrote on August 20th. Been up the greater part of last night with Sergeant Floyd, who is as bad as he can be to live. The motion of his bowels having changed is the cause of his violent attack. When writing his fair copy of the journal, he noticed that Floyd had no pulse and nothing will stay a moment on his stomach or bowels. Lewis and Clark and the other men were truly alarmed at Floyd's condition. About noon, they put ashore for dinner and to make a warm bath for Sergeant Floyd, hoping it would brace him a little, but he was past bracing or help of any kind. Before we could get him into his bath, he expired with a great deal of composure, having said to me before his death that he was going away and wish me to write a letter. And of course that was Clark uh, in his journal saying that, he, that Floyd wanted him to write a letter to his family back home. The captains had done everything they could for him and probably some things they shouldn't have. As already mentioned, if Floyd was indeed suffering from appendicitis and if the appendix was in danger of bursting or had, liberally dosing him with the strong laxative pills of Dr. Benjamin Rush, those infamous thunderclappers due to their powerful purgative effect would have only hastened his death. But this was what Lewis had been trained to do and Clark would have concurred with what his partner administered. It is Joseph Whitehouse who specifically identifies Lewis as the one prescribing medicine to the stricken sergeant. The disease which occasioned his death was a bilious colic which baffled all medical aid that Lewis could administer, White House wrote. Gas, soon to be elected sergeant in Floyd's place, observed that Floyd died even though every possible effort was made by the commanding officers and other persons to save his life. Ordway, White House, and Gas also provide some information that Clark does not. Exactly where did Sergeant Charles Floyd die? All three wrote that after Floyd died, they proceeded on to hills on the north side of the river where he was buried. In his entry, Clark wrote that they took Floyd's body, but then crossed it out and noted the burial ceremony and rites. This might indicate that they did move Floyd's body from where he actually died, but that Clark decided to only note the facts of the burial instead. Gas stated that they traveled about one mile Ordway wrote that they put two on the south or west side of the river. All three, as already mentioned, recorded proceeding to the north or east side of the river to bury Floyd. Clark is not specific about this, but seems to indicate the starboard or that north or east bank of the river as the one on which Floyd died. It might never definitely be known on which side of the Missouri Floyd died, but after he did, he was laid out in the best possible manner, best manner possible, and then carried upstream to the first good hills, which were on the Iowa side, where his grave would be safe from the floods and have a commanding view of the countryside. Clark, Ordway, and White House all provide some details regarding the burial of the fallen, fallen explorer. White House wrote that they dug a grave on the top of a high round knob and interred him with all the honors of war and had a funeral sermon preached over him. Ordway recorded that we dug the grave on a handsome slightly round knob 
close to the bank. We buried him with the honors of war. The usual ceremony performed by Captain Lewis as customary in a settlement. We put a red cedar post, hung and branded his name, date and such. Young Floyd's death may have affected William Clark more than anyone else. Given their family connection going back perhaps 50 years to Virginia, knowing him before the expedition and perhaps mentoring him as he grew into a soldier and leader on the journey had to have deeply saddened Clark. They had lost a member of the party that was truly one of his men who had been with him since the beginning. His account of Floyd's illness, death, and burial is straightforward, but obviously written with a great deal of feeling and sense of loss. We buried him with all the honors of war and fixed a cedar post at his head with his name, title, and day of the month and year. Captain Lewis read the funeral service over him after paying every respect to the body of this deceased man who had at all times given us proofs of his impartiality, sincerity to ourselves and goodwill to serve his country. We return to the boats. Clark's fair copy entry for the day varies slightly from his field version. He was buried with the honors of war, much lamented. A cedar post with the name Sergeant C. Floyd died here 20th of August, 1804, was fixed at the head of the grave. This man at all times gave us proofs of his firmness and determined resolution to do service to his country and honor to himself. After paying all the honor to our deceased brother, we camped in the mouth of Floyd's River. What might have been the scene on top of that high hill with a commanding view of the countryside. The journals record that the explorer's deceased comrade was buried with all the honors of war, had a sermon preached over him, and had a funeral ceremony conducted by Lewis that was common in the settlements. We most likely will never know the details, but by using the basic statements of the three journalists, it can be speculated what the scene might have been. And of course, as Michael Haynes and his wonderful Lewis and Clark art depicts here, what that scene might have been like for the burial of Floyd on August 20th there at the south of present Sioux City, Iowa. After Charles Floyd died, he was washed and perhaps dressed in his best uniform, unless it was deemed best to keep it for others' use. He was wrapped in some available material for a shroud or maybe even placed in a crude coffin. Patrick Gass might have used his carpentry skills to hastily construct a coffin from available boards. If not, there's evidence that oak slabs placed along the inside of the grave and an oak plank or sawed timber placed on top as a lid served as a makeshift coffin. The body was placed on the, key, on the boat and taken to that prominent hill on the north side of the Missouri. A detachment was dispatched to the top to dig the grave. At the landing, a procession was arranged and a signal they solemnly advanced with the body of their fallen comrade. Once at the grave, the men formed ranks beside it and Floyd was lowered in. A mix of a military and civilian service apparently followed. Lewis and Clark, as well as some of the other men, would have been familiar with the procedures of a military funeral. All the men had almost certainly attended at least a general funeral service. Captain Lewis officiated. There would have been a reading from the Bible or perhaps the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. There is no evidence that either was carried on the expedition, but it is likely that at least someone had carried a Bible with them on their wilderness journal journey. Lewis and perhaps Clark would have delivered a short sermon and paid tribute to Floyd and the service he had rendered to his country in the expedition. A hymn might have been sung. The honors of war would have included the firing of three volleys. The grave was then filled in and a cedar post branded Branded, Sergeant C. Floyd died here 20th of August, 1804, placed at the grave's head as a marker and a memorial to this young man of much merit. The men then filed down the hill in the late afternoon heat, boarded their boats, and proceeded on to the mouth of a small river where they camped that beautiful evening. Each with their own thoughts of their dead comrade, 
their own mortality and what might lay ahead of them. In honor of their dead comrade, the captains named the hill where he was buried, Sergeant Floyd's Bluff, and the river where they camped that night, Floyd's River. And what of the letter that the dying sergeant asked his captain to write for him? Could William Clark add his own words to those of Charles Floyd in the letter he asked his captain to write before he went away? Was there time to write the letter before he died? And if it was written, did it find its way to Floyd's family? That might never be known. If it was written, it likely did reach the Floyds. Other letters written to friends, family, and officials were safely delivered. Clark quite possibly penned his own letter to Floyd's family, especially since he knew them. The family had definitely received word of the death of their dear Charles by the late spring of 1805, and probably before then. Newspapers carried news of it by early June, 1805. Although they mourned his death, they took comfort in knowing that he was well cared for as Clark was there, one of them wrote. The next day, the Corps continued their daily struggle up the river toward their confrontation with the Teton Sioux, meeting with the Arikara, and winter stay among the Mandan and Hidatsa. Some of Floyd's personal effects might have been saved for return to his family. It is believed that his journal was sent back down the Missouri in the spring of 1805. Lewis noted in his April 7, 1805 letter to Thomas Jefferson that, I have sent a journal kept by one of the sergeants to Captain Stoddard, my agent at St. Louis, in order as much as possible to multiply the chances of saving something. This seems to indicate that Floyd's journal was held by Stoddard or someone else in St. Louis until Lewis returned. If so, did Lewis then carry it to Kentucky on his return eastward to present it to the late sergeant's family? Did it go ahead? and reach there ahead of them? Did Clark end up with it and give it to the family? Or did he retain it? Did it go to Washington and Jefferson and then come back again to the family? Uh, that we don't know. We do know that there was one item of Floyd's that stayed with the expedition, Floyd's tomahawk. On June 2nd, 1806, while among the Nez Perce Indians, Lewis recorded in his journal that Floyd's tomahawk had been stolen by one Indian who had then sold it to another. The explorers wanted this, as they put it, prized item back and tried to buy it from him, but he was on the point of death and his family wanted to bury it with him. George Druyard and two Nez Perce conducted the negotiations for the Tomahawk's return. The family was finally persuaded to sell it, but they sold it dear, receiving a handkerchief two strands of beads from the Corps' supply of goods, and two horses from the chiefs. Captain C was desirous of returning it to his friends, Lewis wrote. Whether it actually got there is uncertain. By late summer of 1806, the Corps had dropped off the Charbonneau family at the Mandan Hidatsa villages and said goodbye to Kentucky and John Coulter, who had received permission to return westward. They were in a hurry to reach home as they sped down the Missouri River, but they did not neglect to visit their fallen comrade. On September 4th, Clark recorded that he, Lewis, and several men walked to the top of Floyd's Bluff to visit his grave. There, they found the grave had been opened by the natives and left half covered. They filled the grave up again, said a final goodbye to Sergeant Floyd, and continued homeward. Floyd was still in Clark's thoughts on September 23rd when he wrote his famous letter to his brother Jonathan announcing the Corps' successful return and wrapping up the lengthy report intended for publication in order to circulate the news of their return. Clark noted that we have not lost a man since we left the Mandans, which I assure you is a pleasing consideration to me. After the expedition's return, its members scattered. A few made names for themselves, but most returned to the anonymity from which they had come before the journey. The fate of some remain unknown to this day. The grave sites of only a handful are known and only a few are actually marked. Charles Floyd's is one of them. Ironically, the grave of the only man to die on the expedition 
and not make it to the Pacific and back is marked by a monument larger than that for any other member of the Corps, including Lewis and Clark. But such a tribute was not a sure thing. Just as fate intervened in preventing Floyd from completing his journey of discovery, it also intervened in saving his final resting place from being lost. In the years following the expedition, Floyd's grave with a cedar post reaching skyward became a landmark on the Missouri. It was often noted by travelers keeping written accounts of their journey on the Big Muddy. No known drawing of it was made until 1832. In that year, the famous artist George Catlin stopped at the grave and sketched this solitary cedar post, which tells a tale of grief, he wrote. Continuing, he said, he wrote, Floyd's grave is a name given to one of the most lovely and imposing mounds or bluffs on the Missouri River. We encamped a couple of days at its base. I several times ascended it and sat upon the grave, overgrown with grass and the most delicate wild flowers, and beheld from its top the winding infinite of the Missouri and its thousand hills and domes of green, vanishing in the, in the blue in distance. Given Catlin's eye for detail and commitment to accuracy, his painting entitled Floyd's Grave most likely can be relied upon as what was seen by those passing it in the first half of the 19th century. From the time of his death until the encroachment of the dynamic Missouri half a century later, Catlin's painting of Floyd's resting place provides a window into the past, allowing us to see the young Kentuckian's grave as Clark, Lewis, Hunt, Lisa, Bridger, and countless others saw it. In May 1839, the eminent scientific explorer Joseph Nicolette, accompanied by young Lieutenant John Fremont, visited Floyd's grave while exploring the area for the U.S. topographical engineers. He noted in his expedition report that his men replaced the signal or cedar post blown down by winds. It is not clear whether they replaced it as in putting it back up or erected a new one. It is likely that they simply put the post back up. One also wonders that having stood for some 30 years, if it is possible that vandals rather than wind pushed it over. It is impossible to know whether it was the original post. Six years before Nicolette visited, when Prince Maximilian and party ascended the Missouri, he noted that a short stick marks the place where he, Floyd, is laid and was often been renewed by travelers when the fires in the prairies have destroyed it. 18 years after Nicolette's visit, Floyd's resting place was forever disturbed by the shifting waters of the Missouri. In the spring of 1857, during one of his common spring floods, the Missouri undermined Floyd's bluff, sending part of it tumbling into its waters. The bluff was carried away to the point of Floyd's grave, almost 60 perpendicular feet above the river. The post marking the grave and a number of bones possibly fell into the river and were carried away. M.L. Jones of Smithland, Iowa stated in 1895 that he was familiar with the grave and passed it frequently in 1854 and 1855, and that late in the fall of 1856, he noticed that the post, which had been almost intact, had been cut away almost to the ground. Then in late April, 1857, while traveling from Sioux City home to Smithland, Jones recalled he noticed that the swollen river was cutting into the bluff and that the post and grave, which had been about 100 feet from the edge of the bluff, appeared gone. A closer examination confirmed the post being gone and revealed bones protruding from the bank. Word was sent to Sioux City and a party secured what was left of the bones the next day. Other accounts of the 1857 rescue of Floyd's remains offer additional and also contradictory information. Two statements refer to the coffin protruding from the collapsed bank rather than an oak slabs around the grave sides and a board on top, over Floyd. Dr. S.P. Yeomans recollected in 1895 that a rope was tied around a man's waist 
and he was lowered over the edge of the bank to secure a cable to the box so that it could be raised to safety. Judge Noah Levering recalled that same year that in March 1857, it was discovered that the grave was being washed away and a rescue committee gathered up the skull and other bones they found for reburial at a safer spot. It was Levering who noted the oak slab construction of the coffin and that the red cedar posts that he remembered as having been whittled down to a walking six ties by souvenir hunters had slid into the river. Six years later in May 1901, Levering provided additional information. He recalled that Dr. Sloan of Sergeant Bluff, not M.L. Jones, discovered the danger to the grave. And when the rescue committee visited the site the next day, they observed a leg bone protruding from the ground. A young man volunteered to crawl to the edge while the committee held a rope tied around his waist. And using a spade, he dug out bones and pieces of the makeshift coffin. Levering carried the bones home, but his wife didn't like them in the house, so he gave them to Judge Marshall Moore for safekeeping. In May 1857, the remains were placed in a new coffin, carried by the ferry boat Lewis Burns to the bluff, and reinterred in a patriotic and religious ceremony some 600 feet farther back from the edge of the bluff with head and footboards to mark it. He thought the post that had slid into the river was probably the third one to mark the grave, placed there by Nicolette, he surmised. A couple of days after recalling these events, he stated that no bones were lost to the encroachment of the river. Any bones that were missing was due to wild animals disturbing the grave, as early visitors had reported. Almost 40 years would pass before the remains of Sergeant Floyd in his grave would again become the focus of attention. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes, it was Floyd's own journal kept during his fateful journey up the Missouri in 1804 that would provide the spark for a movement that would culminate in a monument honoring him. On February 3rd, 1894, while at the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, examining a pile of notebooks written by that voracious collector, Lyman Draper, Reuben Gold Thwaites, and apparently from what James Butler says, James Butler discovered Floyd's journal. How Draper acquired the journal is uncertain, but once he did, it disappeared into his vast collection. There to lay for some 40 or 50 years until found by Thwaites and maybe Butler. Professor James Butler of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, was vice president of the society. Uh, he presented a paper on it to the American Antiquarian Society in April of 1894. The American Antiquarian Society subsequently published Floyd's journal. These events, together with the publication of Elliot Cow's edition of the Lewis and Clark journals, stirred new interest in the expedition. This was particularly true in the Sioux City area where interest was rekindled in Charles Floyd, his death and his grave. And here you can see this is Butler's letter to Reuben Durrett of Louisville, the primary founder of the Filson Historical Society on February 10th, 1894, in which he talks about, he's commenting kind of on uh, the Thwaites and especially the Cows editions of the journals. And he says, you know, I wonder if all the journals have been found. He said, uh, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if another journal should turn up? And then he says, you know, lo and behold, he says just a week ago today from when he writes this letter, uh, his words prove prophetic for, uh, for another journal was found among the papers of Draper, Charles Floyd's. And then he goes on and, and talks from there. He and he and Dura kind of had a regular back and forth in this period about him wanting information about the Floyd family, Charles Floyd, as he was doing his research. And Elliot Cowes has the same kind of correspondence with, uh, with Dura as well. Area newspapers, especially the Sioux City Journal, carried articles regarding Floyd and his grave and the possibility of erecting a monument honoring him. 
There had been discussion of a monument in 1857 at the time of the rescue and reinterment of his remains, but nothing had come of it. While building a monument to the young sergeant never might have faded entirely from the minds of those who remember the 1857 reburial, it was the events of 1893 and 1894 and into 1895 that proved to be the catalyst that achieved results. An association was formed. This is again Butler to, to Durrett. Uh, an association was proposed by interested Iowans in the Sioux City area in 1895 to finally honor Floyd with a monument. Detailed coverage of the plans by the journal helped stimulate public interest and support for the endeavor. Some of these articles were picked up by the Associated Press and together with letters of support in national publications written by Elliot Cowes, the plan for an association was realized. August 20th, 1895 was set as a date for a suitable ceremony to again reinter Sergeant Floyd's remains and to incorporate the Floyd Memorial Association. This time, unlike 38 years earlier, a proper marker would be placed over the grave until a more substantial monument could be constructed. And here again, you have Butler talking about the 91st anniversary and plans for the 20th to have the meeting and he's urged to be there to carry, actually carry the autograph journal to the very spot where I, I love how he says, where the pen fell from his hands and that with a speech detailing whatever I can learn about the writer. And so hence he's getting a hold of Durrett to see what he can learn about the Floyds. And of course, rather shocking to us that he would just haul Floyd's journal off to Iowa City and hauling it around the, the site of the burial and reading from it out in the open and all that. Uh, that would not happen today, I'm, I'm quite sure. But when they went to find the sergeant's grave, there was a problem. He couldn't find it. In the years since the 1857 reburial, the head and foot markers of the grave had been broken off and their remains were underground. Already in the winter of 1867, engineer Mitchell Vincent of, the, of Inano, Iowa had reported the only visible sign of the grave to be a shallow six inch depression extending perhaps two feet by one foot. Mitchell was conducting railroad work on the bluff at the time and instructed the crew to respect the grave. He recalled that he would have liked to have formed at least a mound over the grave but the ground being frozen prevented him from doing so. When spring arrived, his good intentions were forgotten and Floyd's grave continued a silent neglected witness to the river, rail and road traffic passing by. As the years passed, less and less remained of the grave to identify it. And by 1895, there was no obvious sign of it left. An attempt early in 1895 to locate the grave had failed. The consternation caused by this situation helped stiffen the resolve of the leaders of the memorial movement. Many of them were early residents of the area. Between themselves and the help of the other old settlers, many of whom had attended the 1857 reburial, another attempt was made on Memorial Day, May 30th, 1895. This search met with success. Using faded memories, partly confused from the changed appearance of the bluff, and a more scientific method of probing for color differences in the soil, the grave was found. Desiring other witnesses to be on hand for the exhumation, especially those who had been at the 1857 ceremonies, further digging was delayed until June 6th. Digging on that day revealed several inches below the surface the remains of the oak head and footboards placed there in 1857. Going deeper, the moldering wood of the coffin was uncovered. A spade thrust through it, its top, rotted top, revealed the skull and other bones. The identification was declared successful. Optimism for their monument project was high, and right there on the spot, the Floyd Memorial Association was formed. Upon reflection, the original intention to leave the grave undisturbed was reconsidered. It was decided to remove the skull to town for safekeeping 
and then recover the grave. There would be no forgetting Floyd's grave again. The journal covered the activities and founding of the association and plans immediately were made for reburial ceremonies on the same site for August 20th, the 91st anniversary of the sergeant's death. Over the next three months, the association met regularly and made all necessary arrangements for the August 20th ceremonies. Mitchell Vincent platted the bluff and determined that Floyd's 1804 grave was now 100 feet in the air over the Missouri, and that the 1857 grave was about 360 feet from the solid edge of the railroad cut on the western side of the bluff. When erosion of the bank, the railroad cut, and the present side of the grave all were factored together, Vincent determined that the 1857 grave was southeast from the original one by about 600 feet. At the association's June 24th meeting, John H. Charles was elected president, position he would hold until a monument to Floyd towered over the Iowa prairie six years later. A monument was very important to Charles and he worked diligently toward achieving it. Committees were formed at the meeting with the duties of inviting Cowes and Butler to be speakers of the August 20th ceremonies. Acquiring the land containing the grave for a park and procuring a suitable receptacle for Floyd's bones and proper stone to temporarily mark the grave. On July 6, photographs of Floyd's skull in the vicinity of the original grave were exhibited at a meeting of the executive committee. The photographer, at least of the grave view, was P.C. Walter Meyer of Sioux City. His services were retained for the reburial and monument exercises. Thanks to him and his camera, there are photographs of the 1895, 1900, and 1901 ceremonies. It was also at this meeting that it was decided that a marble slab, seven feet by three feet, and eight inches thick, properly inscribed, would be ordered at a cost of $40, and that a pottery urn would be made to hold the bones. Cal's recommendation that Floyd's skull be given to a historical repository was declined, but two plaster casts of it were made, one of which was given to the Iowa Historical Society. And there you can see in this Walter Meyer photo uh, how they were set up there and one of the urns of which Floyd's bones have been placed properly uh, identified. The day for the reburial ceremonies was fast approaching. There's a close up of it, you can see better. The day for the reburial ceremonies was fast approaching and all the arrangements were coming together from the slab to the train to carry the expected crowd. A detailed schedule of the afternoon and evening programs was approved and articles of incorporation for the association were drafted and ready for adoption. The anticipated day dawned bright and warm. The train departed for Floyd's Bluff at 1.45, 15 minutes behind schedule crowded with some 400 passengers. An additional 100 spectators took other conveyances. From the base of the bluff, the procession was led to the top by the General Hancock Post Number 22 Grand Army of the Republic with fife and drum playing. Old settlers, association officers, speakers, city and county officials, appropriate others and the attendees followed in that order. The association had prepared the grave site prior to August 20th. The other bones had been exhumed and they and the skull placed in two earthenware urns. The urns were viewed by the crowd and then President Charles acting as master of ceremonies opened the program. George, Judge George W. Wakefield speaking on behalf of Sioux City made a brief address. He was followed by James Butler and here in the close up of the other photo, you can see there's Butler in the long white beard holding the original Charles Floyd journal. Uh, Butler delivered the funeral oration. In place of a Bible, Butler held the original Floyd journal. After his address recalling that sad day 91 years earlier, George Perkins representing the Iowa Historical Society and General Hancock Post Commander Eugene Rice, the Reverend H.D. Jenkins, Elliot Cowes and Dr. S.P. Yeomans all delivered short speeches. 
The crowd then gathered around the open grave for photographs. The two urns were lowered into the grave, a wreath and flowers were placed on them, and the grave filled in. The inscribed stone was laid over it, and the articles of incorporated. And there's the, this is an example. This is what's written on the back of these photos. Uh, the, these are coming, and there are more sets of, that are around of these, but these are at the Filson. Uh, and apparently were sent to Ruben Durrett by Butler and, and maybe uh, uh, Wakefield and, and others that were all involved up there in Iowa City with the ceremonies. Uh, but thank goodness they identified them because it, it gives us specific information. So that's not something that, that uh, we always do. And I'm among the guilty of thinking I'll always remember. But here's then how it looked after that August 20th, 1895 ceremony. The inscribed stone was laid over it. The articles of incorporation of the Floyd Memorial Association were signed beside it. And Reverend Jenkins closed the bluff top ceremonies with a benediction. At eight o'clock that night, the evening program began at the Sioux City YMCA Auditorium. The main speaker was Dr. Cowles. And after a few preliminaries, the Lewis and Clark scholars spoke on the expedition. Professor Butler followed speaking on Charles Floyd and again displaying his original journal. Now that the immediate goal of a permanent marker for Floyd's grave had been achieved, the association began working towards its ultimate goal of erecting a monument to the fallen expedition member and learning more about him. And this is where a whole series of letters from Butler and, and Cows to Durrett uh, are sent. This is one uh, Cows sends in November of 1895, uh, in which he is seeking about that. And it's interesting because you know he says you know Charles Floyd was reburied, kind of gives a gives a rundown of this and that, and then he says that and he quotes was one of the nine young men from Kentucky which Clark had of course bestowed that title on the nine that were enlisted at the Falls of the Ohio. Uh, not all of them were actually from Kentucky, but uh, that's where they were enlisted. Uh, and then he goes on to say that. Uh, local citizens, uh, George Wakefield that I just mentioned uh, to Reuben Durrett uh, in December of 95, same thing, asking for more information tells them how they have organized the Floyd Memorial Association and how they want to uh, find out more about Floyd and that they hope to have a monument for him raised. So over the next several years, the board of the association and primarily the executive committee worked toward making a monument to the lone fatality of the Corps of Discovery. At that August 28, 1898 annual meeting of the association, it was reported that one acre of ground surrounding Floyd's grave had been fenced and planted with trees, and that a monument of the type researched, the shaft, would cost about $6,000 to $10,000, depending on the material used. And, you know, not all the back and forth uh, was very friendly. Uh, this letter from Elliot Cowles to Durrett uh, blast uh, James Butler uh, and actually Thwaites too, in a way. Uh, you can see kind of the, uh, the rivalry, the backbiting, the uh, somewhat even kind of hostility between them. Some of you may have read uh, Reuben Gold Thwaites' book, A Float on the Ohio, uh, which he did in the 1890s. And then it's interesting, uh, I've read it, it's quite interesting. It has photographs that accompany it. Uh, but uh, here Cows is kind of sticking it to him saying that he's gotten the book for review, but he's just shocked that Durrett doesn't get the credit by name that he deserves for helping Cows out while he was in Louisville. Uh, he just said, alludes to uh, handsomely to his Louisville host. Uh, but then he goes on, he says, but you can consider yourself uh, with the reflection that it might have been worse uh, for you might have had old Butler in the house too. He is the meanest white man I ever knew. Uh, played me a scurvy trick in 1893, lied to me 
and then abuse me in print for not doing something that he had dishonestly and dishonorably prevented me from doing in his miserable envy, jealousy, and malice. So how's that for not getting along with each other? Uh, I think I can safely say, I know Jay's here, I think I can safely say that uh, Jay Buckley and I and, and our, our fellow Lewis and Clark historians have never had exchanges uh, like something like that. By the time of the 1899 annual meeting, a $5,000 appropriation from Congress had been secured. Financial, uh, final negotiations were underway for the purchase of 21 bluff-top acres surrounding Floyd's grave site for a park. And discussions were being held with the Sioux City Office of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers regarding the planning and construction of a monument. No definite plan had been decided on, but approval was given to John Charles' motion to proceed with a 75-foot-tall shaft of Sioux Falls quartzite to be ready for dedication on August 20th, 1900. This plan proved premature and discussion continued with the Corps of Engineers. The end of the century, whose beginning had witnessed the Lewis and Clark expedition and the dawning of a new century, proved to be the stage upon which a monument to Charles Floyd would become a reality. By May 1900, enough money had been raised to proceed with the monument plans designed by Captain Hiram Chittenden of the Corps of Engineers. In April, the state of Iowa had matched a congressional appropriation of $5,000 for a mon monument. At the nine May meeting of the executive committee, Chittenden's plan was approved. His design was an Egyptian obelisk. His predecessor, Captain James C. Sanford, had recommended the same style of monument. Chitton had thoroughly studied the matter upon assuming supervision of the Sioux City office and reached the same conclusion. In a letter dated January 26, 1900, he stated that the character of the site as the purposes of the work require a monument which shall be imposing in appearance and visible at a great distance dominating the entire valley in its vicinity, rather than an example of fine artistic work whose merits to be appreciated must be examined close by. To this end, the Egyptian obelisk was the best choice. He also listed the types of stone, granite, limestone, and sandstone that could be used. The captain stated that all were suitable, and while granite was the preferred stone, it was likely sandstone would be used due to cost restrictions. Chittenden was correct. A couple of months later, Kettle River Sandstone from a quarry in Minnesota was selected. While cost conscious, the association's executive committee and Chittenden insisted that all materials and workmanship be of good quality. The association's reports and Chittenden's 1901 report to the chief of engineers testify to this. By late May 1900, the plans, finances, and ceremony arrangements were all in place. The next step in the monument project was at hand, pouring the foundation to be followed several months later after that, it's set by the obelisk. All was in readiness for the morning of May 29th. Chittenden assembled 110 men early that morning who had been hired for the day so that he could maintain more direct control over the project. They were government workers doing river work and Sioux City street workers. With the planning and preparation of a military operation, they all were briefed on the project and assigned their duties. The force left the railroad station at seven o'clock and half an hour later, the first concrete was being poured. Everything needed already had been assembled or was hauled in during the day to keep the work progressing. This was extremely important because the foundation had to be poured in one day to assure that it would set as one solid mass. And solid mass it was, measuring 22 feet square at the base, 14 feet square at the top, and 11 feet high, with 32 heavy steel rails interlaced through it. The foundation required 138.6 cubic yards of concrete and weighed some 200 tons. A mechanical mixer was deemed unnecessary and the concrete was mixed by hand. 
as wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow of concrete ran up the ramps and deposited its load in the excavation that would become the foundation, the caisson around the work was built up, the ramps adjusted, and the supplies replenished. Chit and Dennis's assistant engineer, Bathhouse Smith, who the former recognized as supervising much of the work on the project in his 1901 report, kept vigilant eyes on the work's progress. Chin had estimated 10 hours for the work and he hit his mark almost exactly. The last shovel of concrete was deposited at 520 and by six o'clock the workers were headed home. It would now be only a few months before the, store, the stones began to rise skyward to memorialize Sergeant Floyd. Following this tradition, the association chose August 20th to lay the cornerstone of the monument. It had been decided to transfer the sergeant's remains into the monument for permanent entombment there. Accordingly, they were exhumed yet again on the morning of August 20th and placed in the center of the foundation, ready to be covered with concrete during the afternoon ceremonies. And that's the photo you're seeing here is the laying of the cornerstone and the rising of the monument. Just as it had done on August 20th, 1895, the association and citizens of Sioux City planned suitable ceremonies for the event. The heat and blazing sun caused some of the activities to be abandoned, but the main event, the laying of the cornerstone, would be carried out. The parade in town to the station was abbreviated. The railroad cars loaded with some 250 people pulled out for the bluff just behind schedule. They were joined by hundreds of others at the gravesite. And while the 4th Regiment Band, better known as Reed's Band, played a, pick, a quick step, two companies of guardsmen led a scattered procession up the hill. The Reverend J.C. McClintock offered a blessing on the proceedings just after two o'clock. He was followed by George Perkins speaking on behalf of the Iowa Historical Society. Perkins spoke on Floyd, his grave, and the association. The association's board of trustees was unanimously reelected in order to take care of some necessary business. And then the mayor of Sioux City, A.H. Burton, placed a time capsule beside the urns in the center of the monument's base. Some sort of structure apparently housed these items because a concrete top was then placed over top of them. In a mixed military religious ceremony conducted by the GAR posts and guardsmen, the cornerstone was laid. A final address was given and the band played America. Just like his fellow explorers did 96 years before in presenting the honors of war to the fallen soldier, three volleys were fired in salute. The mournful sound of taps then drifted from the bluff to end the ceremony. Lane, following the lane of the cornerstone, the Kettle River sandstone blocks were laid as they were delivered. The core of the monument was filled with concrete as new courses were laid. Delivery was slow and by the end of October, only 16 courses had been laid. With the cold prairie winter approaching, Chittenden expressed doubts that the monument could be completed that year. And he was right. On November 18th, the Minnesota Sandstone Company delivered the last of the stone, four days after work had been suspended for the winter. When work was suspended on November 14th, the monument had risen to a height of 55 feet, just over halfway to his planned 100 feet. The new stone was carefully housed to await for spring. Plans for the spring completion of the monument proceeded during the winter. Contracts and work for the steel fence around the obelisk, the two bronze tablets to be set in the shaft, and grading, paving, and road work around the monument all were awarded or done. Work on the monument resumed on March 28, 1901, and proceeded as rapidly as possible. The obelisk quickly rose higher despite delays caused by high winds. On April 22nd, the capstone of the obelisk was laid, completing the work on the shaft itself. Its final dimensions were height 100.174 feet, base 9.42 feet square, and weight 278 tons. Six sandstone blocks were used in each course. The shaft descended by one third from base to top. And just to divert from the subject a little bit, but directly related to this, 
this photo of the of the capstone there to the monument. This is several years ago. I was watching Sunday morning on CBS, a great program, wonderful. And they did an article on the Washington Monument, and they used this photo as showing the topping off or placing the capstone on the Washington Monument. And I thought, I know that photo. That's Floyd's Monument. It's not the Washington Monument. And so I jumped online and was going to send them a text, you know, an email saying, come on, guys, you know, do your research. Don't mislead people like that. And some other Lewis and Clarker had already beaten me to it. And uh, I don't think they ever said anything more about it and didn't retract it. I don't know. But, but anyway, that's how people doing TV and documentaries and things like that can kind of use what's available. And we all run into instances of that. Related work continue until April 22nd. The placement of the tablets on the east and west faces of the shaft and that's the one for one of them. And then there's one about the Louisiana Purchase, one on the other side. Uh, the roadway from the highway to the monument and the steel fence were completed by late May in time for the Memorial Day dedication on May 30th. Only a little paving work around the monument remained to be done. Memorial Day 1901 in the Sioux City area was a most memorable one. The Floyd Memorial Association planned the ceremonies meticulously, wanting the day that would witness the culmination of years of effort to go perfectly. And perfect it was. The graves of Sioux City soldiers were decorated with flags and flowers early that morning. At 10.15, a special train left for the monument. Once there, its passengers joined those who already had arrived by other means. Reminiscent of the scene that had been played out twice before, the participants and spectators gathered around the grave of Sergeant Floyd, a grave that had changed much in the last six years. New faces and old were among the crowd. President Charles and James D. Butler, again carrying the precious journal just as he had six years earlier. Noah Levering, who had played such an important role in the 1857 rescue of the remains, journeyed from Los Angeles for the occasion. The daughter of William Bratton, one of the nine young men from Kentucky was there, as were many others. The crowd was estimated at some 2,000. Patriotic airs filled the countryside, courtesy of Reed's band, while the dignitaries took seats and the crowd, had settled, the crowd settled down in anticipation of the start of the hour-long ceremonies. An invocation began the dedication, followed by a musical selection, and then Captain Chittenden reviewed the facts of the project that had resulted in this almost $20,000 monument surrounded by a 21-acre park. He then officially offered the monument to the Floyd Memorial Association. John Charles and Vice President George Wakefield accepted the monument with appropriate remarks. There's a, a close-up there showing, again, there's, there's our guy Butler holding the original journal and all the other dignitaries, uh, the Monument Association members and, and what have you with the monument there in the background. John Charles and Vice President George Wakefield accepted the monument with appropriate remarks. The bronze tablets were unveiled and a descendant of Thomas Jefferson spoke. The General Hancock Post then assumed control of the ceremonies and dedicated the monument to the memory of Sergeant Charles Floyd. Professor Butler offered a few remarks and displayed Floyd's journal. He compared it to the monument, saying it was the obelisk Floyd had erected and was his own enduring monument. Shortly before noon, a, bu a bugler blue retreat, so a three volley, volley salute from 24 guns was given and taps sounded from the bluff as the crowd dispersed. Afternoon ceremonies got underway at two o'clock with a parade by Civil War veterans, Sioux City companies of the Iowa National Guard, representatives of civic societies, and city officials. Ending at the Opera House, people went inside and the program began at three o'clock. American flags and bunting decorated the interior of the Opera House and Reed's band was again on hand to play patriotic songs. Other musical groups also participated during the program, singing songs suitable for a day set aside to honor America's warriors. After the invocation, 
a musical selection, and a reading of the Gettysburg Address, the Grand Army of the Republic's memorial service for the dead was performed. A tribute to President Charles moved the well-loved old man, as it was said, to tears. Orator, diplomat, and politician, Iowa's own John A. Kaysen was the main speaker. He spoke for about an hour on the Louisiana Purchase, Lewis and Clark, Floyd, the monument, and what it all signified. America closed the afternoon program. The day's celebration and monument dedication activities drew to a close that night at the courthouse auditorium. There, James Butler delivered the evening's address, again displaying the journal. He recounted its importance and history, the Corps and especially the captain's love for Floyd, the story of the sergeant's tomahawk, and likened the journal to the acorn from which an obelisk grander than any oak has grown. Longtime area resident and association officer S.P. Yeoman spoke next, focusing on the monument, its significance, and its symbolism concerning U.S. history. Noah Levering was recognized for his role in rescuing Floyd's remains and took the opportunity to correct an error concerning the state of those remains in 1857. Patriotic music was played and sung during the program, and that favorite America closed the proceedings of that eventful Memorial Day. All that remained to totally complete the monument was some paving around the obelisk and the inevitable cleanup. Both were accomplished by late June. And on, and on June 30th, Chittenden settled accounts and resigned as engineer for the association. Thus was completed the dream of an enduring memorial to the only member of the Corps of Discovery to die on the expedition. The Floyd Memorial Association accomplished the erection of a monument larger and more impressive than any constructed for any other member of the Corps, including Lewis and Clark. It, was re it has rescued Floyd from the near anonymity that has been the fate of most of the expedition members. 97 years after a cedar post was erected to mark the grave of Sergeant Charles Floyd, a stone obelisk soared above the Missouri and the surrounding prairie to mark his grave. A fitting monument indeed to this young man of much merit. To mark the occasion, a poem by Will Reed Dunroy uh, appeared in the Sioux City Tribune on May 30th, 1901. Uh, it's a little lengthy. I'm just gonna read the first and last stanzas uh, of it because I thought it was, it was really kind of a nice poem and, and something that, that you all would enjoy. The first stanza reads, he sleeps beneath the stately shaft beside the winding river, where prairie grasses clothe the sod and stunted willows quiver. The waters murmur as they flow in a requiem softly, faintly low, and the west winds sigh and shiver. Then one, two, three more, follow that one. And then the last one reads, he sleeps beneath the stately shaft and wrapped in solemn glory. Eternal hills lift up their heads about him old and hoary. And like a finger pointing high, the shaft lifts upward to the sky and tells its deathless story. Now this of course is the most famous and most well-known monument to, to Floyd. And there are others, uh, uh, other remembrances of, of him. There's a couple right here in, in Louisville uh, the Patriots Peace Memorial uh, uh, up River Road outside of downtown uh, memorializes Floyd. There you can see there's his name up in the middle top there. That's a close up of it there. Uh, Floyd is believed to be the first active duty U.S. service person to die west of the Mississippi. Uh, and a historical marker. This is something that uh, the uh, state and local groups uh, involved with the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial did. Uh, we did uh, about 25 Lewis and Clark in Kentucky uh, historical markers across the state from the Mississippi to the Cumberland Gap. And this one is for Charles Floyd, uh, right there where Floyd Station used to be, where you saw the Springhouse at the beginning. And then 
is this one. And uh, this one's something of a mystery. We're not real sure if it is Charles Floyd or not. It's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's identified as being Charles Floyd. Uh, it's a miniature by the famous miniaturist, famous painter, Benjamin Trott. Uh, their date says about 1804. Uh, it's very possibly would be 1805. We know that Trott was in Kentucky painting in that time period. Uh, and here are two other Floyds that Trott painted about that same time. Uh, these are his cousins, first cousins. Uh, Dr. John Floyd and George Rogers Clark Floyd. And you can see they all have what we think of as that Floyd look uh, with, that, with that nose and the mouth and, and all that. Uh, is it Charles Floyd? Uh, perhaps it is. Uh, it's possible that when the family got word, and certainly they knew by the spring, the summer of 1805, and Trot is in the area painting these other miniatures that they ask him to paint one of their beloved Charles who would not be coming home. And based on family descriptions of him, uh, he produced this. So this was not unusual to, to have artists paint people posthumously uh, for memory so people could have that. How it came to be at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I do not know. Uh, but is this Charles Floyd? Uh, it may well be. Uh, and if it is, uh, we know what he, now along with just a few others from the expedition, uh, looked like or just about looked like. Uh, he looks like he ought to be the leading man in a Jane Austen novel or something out of Bridgerton or something. He. Uh, was quite the uh, dashing, handsome young man. Uh, but that's one of the fun things about research. Uh, Aaron and I were talking about this earlier that really one of the, and, and Jay and many others will know too, that that's actually one of the fun things that, that we get to do. Writing and putting all this down can be more work sometimes, but the research can just be really fun. So we have Floyd in writing, and we have Floyd memorialized and we have other things to remember him, perhaps maybe even uh, uh, what, his, what he might've looked like. But uh, he, uh, the only death on the expedition, a uh, member of the Corps, uh, but thanks to his journal uh, and that monument rising uh, beside the Missouri south of Sioux City, uh, he certainly will, will never be forgotten this, as the captain said, this young man of much merit. Thank you. Uh, I know I went kind of long, but, uh, you know, had a lot I wanted to say. And, uh, you know, thank you for your patience if you hung in there with me. Yikes. I'm just now looking at the clock. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know how that goes when you get wrapped up in something. So if you have time, if you need to bail, of course, go right ahead. But if you have time, I think what was there only about six or seven of us looks like, or oh, or no. I guess there's more. Yeah, well, I'm just saying. Thanks yeah. so much. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Uh, I think we all thought we knew Charles Floyd coming in. Now we know more than we we did before. Uh, any questions, comments? Mark. Yeah, I just out of curiosity, uh, Jim is has is it actually Floyd's skull and his bones or it's assumed because it was found in that spot, it was Floyd's skull and bones. And well, I'll tell you, Mark, that, that can be a good question. You know, everybody believes that they were his, you know, despite as uh, Lewis and Clark mentioned coming back down the river in 1806, that the grave had been disturbed uh, and they covered it up again. And that after that, there's there doesn't seem to be anything in the way of vandalism grave robbing they all believe it is there are you familiar with the reconstruction of the skull that was done back 20 or so years ago uh that's the model that is at the uh, museum there in sioux city uh it has it has the floyd look to it with the nose and everything 
And so I'm inclined to think, and of course we can't say for sure, but I'm inclined to think that those were indeed his, his bones, his skull that were still in that grave. No, no, no descendants on which DNA could be performed, presumably then, or that don't want to do it. Uh, there are Floyd descendants around, uh, you know, collaterally. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I don't know, you know, given since the, the original bones, as, all of them, as we know anyway, are now underneath that monument. Uh, there's no way that they can they can get a get a scraping to try to do some DNA from it, but uh, I'm inclined to think that those were indeed his uh, his bones. You know, I mean, the whole thing of the grave falling in and remnants of of either the slabs of wood or coffin and all that. I think it's uh, it's likely that those were indeed his bones. I'm curious to know, I think Iowa Historical still has the cast of the skull. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold. Uh, I don't know what happened to the other skull. And one of the letters talks about uh, when they're hitting Durrett up for information on Floyd, that they're sent, they send him a photograph of Floyd's skull. Uh, we don't have that in the collection at the Filson. So it maybe drifted off somewhere else, or it might have given it to somebody, or maybe it got off in some other collection. And if it's not identified, nobody knew what the heck it was. Any other questions? I thought that was terrific. Has something been done? Or when I was in uh, Clarksville, there was a place called Floyd's Knob. Is that connected to the family? Those are uh, believed are named for his brother Davis, who uh, was quite prominent. He, I mentioned, he and uh, and his dad, Charles's dad, ran the ferry across from Clarksville, the mouth of Mill Creek, across to the Kentucky shore, and then that was downstream at the foot of the falls, and then you took the uh, the uh, road up to the lower landing road they called it up to uh, Louisville. Davis went on to be involved in Indiana politics. Uh, he was involved in the militia. He actually does some uh, pre-expedition work for William Clark trying to find John Connor uh, who they tried to recruit as the interpreter first. Uh, so he's very involved. He ends up as a government, a federal government official down in Florida, and he dies down there. And we believe both Floyd County and Floyd's Knobs are named in honor of Davis. Uh, Floyd County, Kentucky, uh, and Floyd's Fork and, and, other, and other sites in, in Kentucky are named for Colonel John Floyd who was the one killed by Indians in 1783. Well, that was great, Jim. And uh, if there are no other questions, we'll just sort of look forward to your, your next uh, enterprise, which will be in August. And uh, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be our next opportunity to hear from you. So looking, looking forward to it. It'll right. be a good meeting. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, everyone, yeah. for attending. And uh, we'll we have nothing scheduled right now, uh, as far as I know, but uh, I'm sure that'll change. So we'll let you know. All right. Thank you, guys. Right, thank you. Good seeing you. All right. Thank All right. you. Bye bye. Bye.